Hi everyone, I'm Miss Mary Beth. I'm the Youth Services Librarian at Ingalls Memorial Library and Ringe. And I'm here today for Armchair Adventures. And that's our series where every day I read a little bit of a book and eventually we finish a whole book together. And right now, <laughs> right now we're reading The Princess and the Goblin. And if you've been reading with us, we're up to, I feel like it's getting to a pretty exciting part where Irene is a princess who lives in a kingdom where goblins live below the land. They live in the mines underground. The goblins don't like the royal family. But our friend Curdy, he's 12, he works in the mines. He knows all about the goblins. He's pretty brave. But he also found out that they have a plot against the royal family. So he wants to find out what that plot is. But when he was trying to discover what the plot was, the goblins found him. And so they hid him in a cave and they trapped him. So last we, when we left Curdy, he was trapped in a cave and he couldn't get out. And then our princess Irene followed a magic thread that her grandmother had given her. There's a long story there, but the grandmother lives way up in the tower of the castle. Nobody else really knows that she's there and she's magic. She's pretty nice to Irene. She's nice to Irene, but we don't really know much about her. But so she gave Cur Irene this thread to follow. So Irene follows the thread and it leads her to what appears to be a blocked up cave wall. So Irene is very upset because she's down in the mines and she's lost and she doesn't know where she is and the thread led her to a wall. And that's where we left off. Let's find out what happens. So chapter 21 is called The Escape. <gasps> oh good. As the princess lay and sobbed, she kept feeling the thread mechanically, following it with her finger many times up to the stones in which it disappeared. By and by she began, still mechanically, to poke her finger in after it between the stones as far as she could. All at once it came into her head that she might remove some of the stones to see where the thread went next. Almost laughing at herself for never having thought of this before, she jumped to her feet. Her fear vanished. Once more she was certain her grandmother's thread could not have brought her there just to leave her there, and she began to throw away the stones from the top as fast as she could, sometimes two or three at a handful, sometimes taking both hands to lift one. After clearing the stones away a little, she found that the thread turned and went straight downward. Hence, as the heap sloped a great deal, growing, of course, wider towards the space, she had to throw away a multitude of stones to follow the thread. After going straight down for a little way, she, it turned first sideways in one direction, then sideways in another, and then shot at various angles, hither and thither inside the heap, so that she began to be afraid that to clear the thread she must move the whole huge gathering of stones. She was dismayed at the very idea, but, losing no time, she set to work with a will, and with aching back and bleeding fingers and hands, she worked on, sustained by the pleasure of seeing the heap slowly diminish and begin to show itself on the opposite side of the fire. Another thing which helped to keep her courage was that, as long as she uncovered a turn of the thread, instead of laying loose upon the stone, the thread tightened up, and this made her sure that her grandmother was at the end of it somewhere. She had gotten about halfway down when she star star started and nearly fell with a fright. Close to her ears, as it seemed, a voice broke out singing, Jabber, bother, smash! You'll have it all in a crash! Jabber, bother, smash! You'll be the worst of the pother! Jabber, bother, jabber! Here, Curdy stopped. It's Curdy. He stopped either because he could not find a, word to ri find a rhyme to the word jabber, or because he remembered though he what he had forgotten when he woke up at the sound of Irene's labors that his plan was to make the goblins think he was getting weak. But he had uttered enough to let Irene know who he was. It's Curdy! She cried joyfully. Hush! Came Curdy's voice again from somewhere. Speak softly. Why, you were singing loud, said Irene. Yes, but they know I am here, and they don't know that you are. Who are you? I'm Irene, answered the princess. I know who you are quite well. You're Curdy. Why, however did you come here, Irene? My great-great-grandmother sent me, and I think I found out why. You can't get out, I suppose, she asked. No, I can't, answered Curdy. What are you doing? I'm clearing away a huge heap of stones. <gasps> There's a princess, exclaimed Curdy in a tone of delight. But he was still speaking in little more than a whisper. I got too excited, I think. I can't think how you got here, though. My grandmother sent me after her thread, answered Irene. I don't know what you mean, said Curdy, but so long as you're there, it doesn't matter. Oh, yes, yes, it does, muttered Irene. I never should have been here but for her. You can tell me all about it when we get out, then. There's no time to lose now, said Curdy. 
and Irene went to work, as fresh as when she began. There's such a lot of stones, she said. It will take me a long time to get them all away. How far have you got? asked Curdie. I've got about halfway, but the other half is ever so much bigger, she answered. I don't think you will have to move the lower half. Do you see a slab laid up against the wall? Irene looked and felt about with her hands, and soon perceived the outlines of the slab. Yes, she answered, I do. Then I think, rejoined Curdie, when you have cleared the slab about halfway down, or a little more, I shall be able to push it over. I must follow my thread, returned Irene, whatever I do. What do you mean? exclaimed Curdie. You'll see when you get out, answered the princess, and went on harder than ever. But she was soon satisfied that what Curdie wanted done and what the thread wanted done were one and the same thing. For she not only saw that by following the turns of the thread she had been clearing the face of the slab, but that, a little more than halfway down, the thread went through the chink between the slab and the wall into the place where Curdie was confined, so that she could not follow it any farther until the slab was out of her way. As soon as she found this, she said in a joyous whisper, Now, Curdie, I think if you were to give a great push, the slab would tumble over. Stand quite clear of it, then, said Curdie, and let me know when you are ready. Irene got off the heap and stood on one side of it. Now, Curdie, now! Curdie gave a great rush with his shoulder against it. Out told the slab on the heap, and out crept Curdie on top of it. Hooray! You've saved my life, Irene. He said, Oh, Curdie, I'm so glad. Let's get out of this hard place as fast as we can. That's easier said than done, returned Curdie. Oh, no, it's quite easy, said Irene. We have only to follow my thread. I'm sure that is going to take us out now. She had already begun to follow it over the fallen slab into the hole, while Curdie was searching the floor of the cavern for his pickaxe. Here it is, she cr he cried. No, it is not, he added in a disappointed tone. What can it be, then? I declare it's a torch. That is jolly. It's better than my. It's almost better than my pickaxe. Much better if it weren't for these stone shoes, he went on as he lighted the torch by blowing the last embers of the expiring fire. When Curdie looked up, with the lighted torch casting a glare around the great dark, into the great darkness of the cavern, he caught sight of Irene disappearing into the hole out of which he himself had just come. What are you going in there for? he cried. That's not the way out. That's where I couldn't get out. I know that, whispered Irene, but this is the way my thread goes, and I must follow it. What nonsense the child talked, said Curdie to himself. I must follow her, though, and see that she comes to no harm. She will soon find that she can't get out that way, and then she will come with me. So Curdie crept over the slab once more into the hole with his torch in his hand. When he looked about in the hole, all he, he couldn't see her anywhere. And now he discovered that, although the hole was narrow, it was much longer than he had supposed. For in one direction the roof came down very low, and the hole went off in a narrow passage, of which he could not see the end. The princess must have crept in there. He got on his knees in, in one hand, and holding the torch with the other, he crept after her. The hole twisted about, in some parts so low that he could hardly get through, and in others so high that he could not see the roof. But everywhere it was narrow, far too narrow for a goblin to get through, and so I presume they never thought that Curdie might. He was beginning to feel very uncomfortable, lest something should have befallen the princess, when he heard her voice almost close to his ear, whispering, Aren't you coming, Curdie? And when he turned the next corner, she stood there waiting for him. I knew you couldn't go wrong in that narrow hole, but now you must keep by me, for here is a great wide place, she said. I can't understand it, said Curdie, half to himself, half to Irene. Never mind, she said. Wait till we get out. Curdie, utterly astonished that she had already got so far, and by a path he had known nothing of, thought it better to let her do as she pleased. At all events, he began, he said again to himself, I know nothing about the way, minor as I am, and she seems to think she knows something about it, though how she could passes my comprehension. So, she's just as likely to find her way out as I am, as, and as she insists on taking the lead, I must follow. We can't be much worse off than we are now, anyhow. Reasoning thus, Curdie followed her a few steps, and he came out in another great cavern, across which Irene walked in a straight line, as confidently as if she knew every step of the way. Curdie went on after her, flashing his torch about, and trying to see something of what lay around him. Suddenly he started back a pace as the light fell upon something close by which Irene was passing. It was a platform of rock raised a few feet from the floor and covered with sheepskins, <gasps> upon which lay two horrible figures asleep, at once recognized by Curdie as the king and queen of the goblins. <gasps> he lowered his torch instantly, lest the light should awake them, and as he did so it flashed upon his pickaxe, lying by the side of the queen, who 
whose hand lay close by the handle of it. The queen stole his pickaxe. Stop one moment, he whispered. Hold my torch, and don't let the light go on their faces. Irene shuddered when she saw the frightful creatures whom she had passed without observing them, but she did as he requested, and turning her back, he, she held the torch low in front of her. Curdie drew his pickaxe carefully away, and as he did so, he spied one of her feet, projecting from under the skins. The great clumsy granite shoe, exposed thus to his hand, was a t temptation not to be resisted. He laid hold of it, and with cautious efforts, pulled the shoe off. The moment he succeeded, he saw to his astonishment that what he had sung in ignorance to annoy the queen was actually true. <gasps> she had six horrible toes. Overjoyed at his success, and seeing by the huge bump in the sheepskins where the other foot was, he proceeded to lift them gently, for if he could only succeed in carrying away the other shoe as well, he would be no more afraid of the goblins than of so many flies. But as he pulled the, at the second shoe, the queen gave a growl and sat up in bed. The same instant, the king awoke also and sat up beside her. <gasps> Run, Irene, cried Curdie, for though he was not now in the least afraid for himself, he was for the princess. Irene looked once around, saw the fearful creatures awake, and like the wise princess she was, dashed the torch on the ground and extinguished it, crying out, Here, Curdie, take my hand! He darted to her side, forgetting either the queen's shoe nor his pickaxe, and caught hold of her hand as she sped fearlessly where her thread guided her. They heard the queen give a great bellow, but they had a good start, for it would be some time before they could get torches lighted to pursue them. Just as they brought, thought they saw a gleam of ballot behind them, the thread brought them to a very narrow opening, through which Irene crept easily, and Curdie crept with difficulty. Now, said Curdie, I think we shall be safe. Of course we shall, returned Irene. Why do you think so? asked Curdie. Because my grandmother is taking care of us, answered Irene. That's all nonsense, said Curdie. I don't know what you mean. Then if you don't know what I mean, what right have you to call it nonsense? Asked the princess, a little offended. I beg your pardon, Irene, said Curdie. I did not mean to vex you. Of course not, returned the princess. But why do you think we shall be safe? Because the king and queen are far too stout to get through that hole. There might be ways around, said the princess. I'm sure there might. We are not out of it yet, acknowledged Curdie. What do you mean by the king and queen? asked the princess. I would never call such creatures as those a king and queen. Their own people do, though, answered Curdie. The princess asked more questions, and Curdie, as they walked leisurely around, gave her a full account not only of the character and habits of the goblins, so far as he knew them, but of his own adventures with them, beginning from the very night after that in which he met her and Ludi upon the mountain. When he had finished, he begged Irene to show him how it was that she had come to his rescue. So Irene, too, had to tell a long story, which she did in a rather roundabout manner, manner interrupted by many questions concerning things she had not explained. But her tale, as he did not believe more than half of it, left everything as unaccountable to him as before, and he was nearly as much perplexed as to what he must think of the princess. He could not believe that she was deliberately telling stories, and the only conclusion he could come to was that Ludie had been playing the child tricks, intervening no end of lies to frighten her for her own purposes. But however did Ludie come to let you into the mountains alone? he asked. Ludie knows nothing about it, answered Irene. I left her fast asleep, at least I think so. I hope my grandmother won't let her get into trouble, for it wasn't her fault at all, as my grandmother very well knows. But how did you find your way to me? persisted Curdie. I told you already, answered Irene, by keeping my finger upon my grandmother's thread, as I am doing now. You don't mean you've got the thread there? asked Curdie. Of course I do. I've told you so ten times already. I have hardly, except when I was removing the stones, taken my finger off of it. There, she added, guiding Curdie's hand to the thread. You feel it yourself, don't you? I feel nothing at all, replied Curdie. Then what can be the matter with your finger? I feel it perfectly. To be sure, it is very thin, and in the sunlight looks just like the thread of a spider, though there are many of them twisted together to make it. But for all that, I can't think why you shouldn't feel it as well as I do. Curdie was too polite to say he did not believe there was any thread there at all. What he did say was, well, I can make nothing of it. I can, though, answered Irene, and you must be glad of that, for it will do for both of us. We're not out yet, said Curdie. We soon shall be, returned Irene confidently. And now the thread went downwards and led Irene's hand into a hole in the floor of the cavern, whence came the sound of running water which they had been hearing for some time. It goes into the ground now, Curdie, she said, stopping. He had been listening to another sound, which his practiced ear had caught long ago, which had also been growing louder, 
It was the noise the goblin miners made at their work, and they seemed to be at no great distance now. Irene heard it the moment she stopped. What is that noise? she asked. Do you know, Curdie? Yes, it is the goblins digging and burrowing, he answered. And you don't know what they do it for? No, he answered. I haven't the least idea. Would you like to see them? he asked, wishing to have another try after their secret. If my thread took me there, I shouldn't mind so much. But I don't want to go see them, and I can't leave my thread. It leads me down into the hole, and we had better go at once, she had answered. Very well. Shall I go in first? said Curdie. No, better not. You can't feel the thread, she answered, stepping down through a narrow break in the floor of the cavern. Oh, she cried, I am in the water. It's running strong, but it's not deep, and there's just room to walk. Make haste, Curdie. He tried, but the hole was too small for him to get in. Go on for a little bit, he said, shouldering his pickaxe. In a few moments, he had cleared a larger opening and followed her. They went on, down and down with the running water, and Curdie getting more and more afraid it was leading them to some terrible gulf in the heart of the mountain. In one or two places, he had to break away the rock to make room before even Irene could get through, at least without hurting herself. But at length they spied a glimmer of light, and in a minute more they were almost blinded by the full sunlight into which they emerged. It was some little time before the princess could see well enough to discover that they stood in her own garden, close by the seat on which she and her king papa had sat that afternoon. They had come out by the channel of the little stream. Stream. She danced and clapped her hands with delight. Now, Curdie, she cried, won't you believe what I told you about my grandmother and her thread? For she had felt all the time that Curdie not, was not believing what she told him. There, don't you see it shining on for us? she added. I don't see anything, persisted Curdie. Then you must believe without seeing, said the princess, for you can't deny it has brought us out of the mountain. I can't deny we are out of the mountain, and I should be very ungrateful indeed to deny that you had brought me out of it. I couldn't have done it for the thread, persisted Irene. That's the part I don't understand, answered Curdie. Well, come along, and Ludie will get you something to eat. I'm sure you must want it very much. Indeed I do, answered Curdie. But my father and mother will be so anxious about me, and I must make haste. First up the mountain to tell my mother, and then down to the mine again to let my father know. Very well, Curdie, but you can't get out without coming this way, and I will take you through the house, for that is nearest. They met no one, by the way, for indeed, as before, the people were here and there and everywhere searching for the princess. When they got in, Irina found that the thread, as she had half expected, went up to the old staircase, and a new thought struck her. She turned to Curdie and said, My grandmother wants me. Do come up with me and see her. Then you will know that I have been telling you the truth. Do come. Please, Curdie. I can't bear you should think that what I say is not true. I never doubted you believed what you said, returned Curdie. I only thought you had some fancy in your head that was not correct. But do come, dear Curdie. The little miner could not withstand this appeal, and though he felt shy in what seemed to him a great huge house, he yielded, and he followed her up the stairs. And that is the end of chapter 21. So join me tomorrow to find out what happens when Curdie meets the great-great-grandmother. Thanks for reading with me. Have a fun day.